Broadcasting from Berlin, Germany, Solutions Review is on location at Mobile Iron Live 2019. Brought to you by Mobile Iron. We are back at the Motorwork in Berlin, Germany for Mobile Iron Live 2019. Uh, there's been a lot of expert guests and we're joined by one right now. That's Paul Mackay, Senior Analyst at Forrester. Thanks for being here. No problem, that's absolutely fine. Well, we uh, just saw you give a, a, an excellent presentation uh, specifically around the term of the moment, which is zero trust. Uh, and I know it's actually a term that was coined by a Forrester analyst. Yeah, that's right. Um, the term was actually originally coined by <coughs> Forrester analyst um, John Kendervark, who is a former colleague of ours. Um, he came up with the idea in 2010 really to respond to a failing in the way in which we'd been thinking about security of the preceding 15 to 20 years, which was we kind of had this view that you could build a perimeter around your enterprise network, almost like kind of the, the castle fortress with the walls and the moats and a very small set of controlled entry and exit points. But then once you were inside the castle walls, you were kind of trusted to be the world was your oyster. The world was your oyster, yeah. And what I typically found in organizations, and John had this as well, was that the networks inside, once you got inside the perimeter, were flat as pancakes. So once you were in, you could go anywhere you like. So from a cybersecurity adversarial perspective, if you found a way of penetrating that perimeter or using social engineering to get through the perimeter defenses through some kind of phishing link or something like that, you could effectively laterally traverse around the network in any way you wanted because a lot of customer networks were not segmented or um, separated enough to prevent that kind of mal malicious uh, malware spread from happening. If you think about contagion risk in the same way as you would think about a human pandemic virus or something similar. So for me, the, the thing that was really interesting about his observation was he saw that cloud was coming along in a big way, particularly in the United States. And at the time, this was the era, the iPhone had just come out, the iPad had come out. We were seeing executives in lots of large blue chip companies who were really interested in being able to work using mobile devices because of the enhanced productivity and uh, utility that it gave them to work while they were on the move. And I think what we've really seen is that his, no, his observation that we could no longer use the network as a place where we could put trust in as the sole determinant of whether we ha could use that as a security device control construct was fundamentally flawed in this new paradigm. So as those new alignments happened in the market, what we saw was John's observation was, number one, you have to address the aspect of never trusting devices implicitly just because of where they sit on the network. You have to verify the device, the user, the identity, and also be absolutely aware of the data that you're trying to access and should that person even be doing that? Are they performing that in line with their job role and so on and so forth? Well, and it's a cultural change, isn't it? Because, it is, yes. because of the traditional, I mean, it very is a, a very much like thinking about a perimeter. Uh, everybody would like to think of it as bricks and mortar that course, they've built. Yes. But in the end, it's only as thick and, and, and sturdy as the you know the weakest employee who clicks on whatever phishing attempt, uh, and then and then they're inside, and and so that cultural shift is really the challenge right now because there's been so much invested in building that perimeter, yes. and you're asking people now to say you have to think about it's not moats and and and, yeah. and walls, it's it's a completely different. Yeah, and I, and, I th and I think the way that I usually tend to characterize it when I'm having discussions with my customers in Europe is that, yes, it is a different way of thinking, but ultimately it, it is a journey. You don't just wake up one morning and go, right, I'm going to spend 20 million euros on implementing a zero trust network, and by the end of it, right, I'm going to scrap everything. Yeah, I'm going to scrap everything. <laughs> what we actually recommend is that you take a hard look at some of the assumptions that underpin your existing controls you can actually make a lot of improvement by improving what you have already. And then over time, as you gain better understanding of, particularly as you move towards cloud environments and you have mobility and remote working as a kind of 
de facto standard these days, you migrate towards a zero trust approach over time. So where we tend to tell people to start is to focus with identity. Ultimately, it's people that access systems and services and data. Then we tell people, once you've got identity sorted, very quickly and almost at the same time, you need to be thinking about the devices. Because ultimately, it's the combination of people and devices and the lack of security around those things, which actually contribute something of the order of 81% of breaches that occur in, in, in real life. Well, and ultimately, that's been the biggest change technologically. It's not, the people haven't changed, and they're no, still they just haven't. as vulnerable and susceptible as ever. It's really the, the endpoints that have started to change and, and, yes. and completely change, really. And the mobile device being the most obvious. And, and that is, you know, certainly what we're hearing at this Mobile Iron event is that, that the old ways just aren't up to able to handle what this new technology is bringing. To yeah, bear. and while that's true, I think I, I like to be positive uh, about this because if I actually think about we, we, I talked about in my presentation about zero trust as a concept and a security model is not as well recognized or used within the European market as we see within North America where it's pretty much um, the buzzword of the day yes. and it becomes a very um, starting to become a bit of an overused phrase but here in the European market what I've generally found through my research is that customers are being presented with the challenges from moving to a cloud-based environment of having agile delivery teams de delivering applications, delivering new ways of interacting with consumers. And they've been forced to reimagine the security model. And what I find under the hood is that the way in, the, in which they've reimagined their security model to cope with the new paradigm they're facing, they're actually implementing zero trust, so just maybe not calling it that or labeling it that. Right. So I think underneath the radar, there's a lot of good practice that comes from the zero trust model that's being implemented independently by my customers across Europe. They just haven't yet joined the dots and pulled that together into a coherent security model and architecture that underpins their enterprise security model in the 21st century. Well, and it's, uh, it's, it's the old uh, analogy that, that we use often, which is assembling the bicycle as you're motoring down the, down the street. It's, it's, a, it's a juggling act for the IT professional to bring in all these new cloud services, build internal apps, and still maintain security, and, and have to think about security in a very different way. Uh, and it's, it's, it's not an easy, which I'm sure is why a lot of your customers are asking you for advice, because it's a very tricky move to be able to pull all that together. Yes, that's true, and I think <clears throat> there are a couple of specific areas of the framework which, if not handled correctly, can prove a little bit more problematic in the European market. A couple that come to mind includes within the data component of the framework, you need to think very carefully about where are you storing data, where is that cloud that you're putting stuff into, and how are you securing access to it? Because actually we have privacy laws such as the GDPR, which actually put a different regulatory framework in place than maybe is the case in some of the implementations that we see in the USA, but also there are other areas of the framework where if you're going to, for example, implement analytics to increase your visibility of what's going on in your zero trust environment, if you're going to start monitoring employees, if you're here in Germany, you can't just do that. You need to engage with your workers' council and have that conversation to get them comfortable that what you are doing is not going to place your employees at any disadvantage and that there are bona fide reasons as to why you're doing that. So again, these things aren't impossible or are going to come and cause roadblocks, but they need to be planned for at the outset within a European context so that you can really make sure that they don't become the roadblock that inhibits you from moving towards this model. Well, and I think that's really the, the, the story of the moment is to, is to think about it as an evolution, to think about yeah. it as a phased in approach. But, but to begin with the, with the initial thought of we need to we need to come at this differently because because what I mean just given the massive amount of breaches that are happening and what has been used has just not been good enough and the world continues to change and so what would you provide for advice to uh, a typical customer as 
as they start to think about 2019 and beyond uh, in terms of, you know, obviously everybody's different, but how, how should they start to think about phasing that in? So I, <clears throat> so I think my experience so far is that most customers don't move to Zero Trust as a distinct project in its own right. It's usually coupled with a wider business transformational change within the IT function and also in terms of how the business delivers its services to its customers. So I think my, my core advice would be look for the opportunity within your organization to take the steps we mentioned a few moments ago around where to start the Zero Trust framework, but look for the transition to the cloud, the expansion of mobility, the change in business model. Look for that disruptive business opportunity as a real opportunity to embrace the Zero Trust security model, which will help underpin that and ultimately help the business execute on its strategy. That would be the one piece of advice I would give. If it's started as a purely technology focused and IT focused initiative, I don't think it's going to go anywhere because it will just be seen as, oh, it's those security people and networks people saying that we need to do this stuff and I don't really see why we need to do that. So again, I think the CIO and the CISO can really help themselves by thinking about the two in tandem at the outset. Well, and it's a balanced approach. I think it's excellent advice. Paul Mackay, Senior Analyst at Forrester, thanks for swinging by. We appreciate the time. Uh, it's certainly uh, the kind of information that you should be paying attention to. Forrester is writing extensively about it, and, and Paul has actually got uh, Zero Trust, a new Zero Trust article up that you just put up recently, right? Research? Yeah, that, yeah that's right. Um, along with Chase Cunningham, Principal Analyst, and Enzo Iannapolo, Senior Analyst, who are two of my good colleagues. We spent some time looking at some of the specific practices that can help you implement a zero trust model within a European environment in terms of the regulations, the cultural uh, aspects that you need to pay attention to so that the implementation goes smoothly. Thank you. Excellent, thanks. Thank you. Cheers.